the, uh, but that was outside. I'm going to talk in the summer series of the Tony Royak History Festival. It's been a delightful series, uh, lots of interesting stuff going on, and this evening will be no less interesting. The festival is sponsored by the Washburn Heritage Association and the Washburn Area Historic Society and made possible by a grant from the Apostle Islands Historic Preservation Conservancy. We wish to thank uh, Harborview for hosting the event this evening and also to thank uh, Andrew Grimm for his technical assist assistance and uh, video work. We will look at abundance of COVID precautions. We are not serving refreshments tonight, as you've noticed. Uh, we ask that you observe the Eastville County recommendation for large groups, wearing masks and distancing from those outside your group. If you wish to linger after the presentation, please do so on the outdoor patio or outside. And watch for our winter schedule and be sure to let us know if you would like to do a presentation. I uh, am blessed with the opportunity to introduce our presenter this evening, who grew up in Chicago and uh, left that area, moved to the Schwabigan Bay area, and has lived here for 38 years until just recently, during which time he was a, he taught at the Ashley Elementary in grades one to four, and eventually was the elementary principal there. Um, one of the things that happened to him when he, uh, when he moved to the Schwabigan Bay area, he was converted from a bear fan to a Packer fan. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be apologetic in the least. Um, he's retired now, living in, in Bronx, New York, and is currently writing a novel, which I'm sure he'll be happy to tell you more about. Let's give a Schwabigan Bay welcome to John Esther. Mindful of uh, volume, I hope to be uh, have it reach uh, into the far reaches of the uh, church seating in the back. More? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it can be turned up more. I can speak louder though, so I'll I'll do that. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I'm really glad to be here. Welcome to everyone. Uh, this is a subject that's near and dear to me because I'm still a devout ice fisherman. I come up here every. Uh, end of February for a month into March, so I can be out on the lake and uh, uh, hopefully among the islands, depending on the ice year, in order to do some uh, bobbing and whatever else we can fish for that we get the opportunity to fish for. Uh, so this this book, I, I published it in 2015, and I had started ice fishing back in like 1996 up here, and I was taken out by a local friend of mine in Bayfield, Arden Weber. And so I, I learned to start bobbing and ice fishing in the big water, and I just got, so to speak, hooked on it. And it ended up, it just ended up being almost a, a compulsion. And uh, I, I looked forward to winters because the winters would go too fast because every weekend, every weekend you lived for the weekend so you could get out on the ice again. And it was just, it was something about it. It was a combination of the camaraderie and, and the adventure and, uh, and you know, uh, ultimately the fishing. But there was so much more that goes out on the ice, goes on out, out on the ice uh, besides just fishing. And the genesis for the book started when we would go to breakfast mm -hmm. before going out on the ice. And, and my friend Arden Weber always says, always have a good breakfast because it might be your last. <laughs> really, and that's what he'd say. So, you know, and I didn't, I didn't take it too seriously, but uh, then we started, we'd go to breakfast and, and there'd be a bunch of old timers and whether we were at uh, uh, Mary Rice's place or at the Grunkies, and uh, guys would start telling stories and they'd tell stories about, uh, you know, what they did, what their fathers did, what their grandpas did, and I, I was just fascinated and I, and I kept saying, you know, from week to week, I kept saying, somebody's got to preserve this, somebody's got to preserve it as well. It ended up, Nobody, they, you know, I, I looked around the room and, you know, I, there weren't many readers, let alone writers, you know, I mean, as far as, you know, 
putting together something like this, and, and, and I didn't know what I was getting into either. So I, I decided, okay, I'm gonna do this. So you know, the, my immediate friends, the guys I knew, I was going to interview them. And so I came up with some, you know, some general questions. So, you know, when did you first start going on the ice? And uh, you know, what was your most memorable time? Did you ever have any close calls? Things like that. And so, and so then I, I got together with those guys and, and interviewed them, and they, and I, I, they were really, really good. I really enjoyed. It. I thought the stories were great. And then I said, well, who else do you know that are experienced ice fishermen or, or that have been on the ice a lot? And so then I, my list started growing and growing, and ultimately I ended up uh, interviewing uh, 52 guys and two gals, so 54 people, and I recorded everything on a, a cassette tapes at the time. And then when I went to type them out, I typed them in their, not only in their own words, but in the way they spoke. So if they'd say, uh, you know, fishing instead of fishing, or, uh, and I did this instead of and, you know, I, I typed it all up, and you know, and then whenever they would use any <laughs> expressions such as a or, or you know, the way we speak up here, they uh, they would do that, and, and so, you know, there was a lot of uh, you know Swedes and Finns and Norwegians that I interviewed, and so I got a, you, know, you got a lot of culture along with the the history too, and especially on on the ice, and, and there was just story after story. So uh, anyway. Uh, before I get going, I better get back and start moving the uh, slides, so so we don't get lost here. Uh, this is a picture of Lake Superior. You can see you can see the islands right here. There's uh, you know there's Madeline, there's uh, Stockton, there's Outer, and so that's and, and the area that I covered for stories were all the way from Port Wayne, maybe, uh, and then to Little Girls Point, which is down this way, uh, outside of Ashland. So everything in between there, uh, and including the bay. So, and, and this was a year that the uh, lake was heavily frozen over. You can see, this is all ice. The only water is that, um, and that dark, that dark spot could be water or it could be skim ice. So, because that was the year it, flo it froze completely over. And then you can see the islands, they're all socked in because they, when they're white, that means they, that's old ice, that's been there a while. Uh, here, here's the book. Uh, the cover's cool because uh, it was a far away shot, so the figure was really small in this. And this is, uh, this is a resident of Washburn and uh, Chuck Carrier. Does anybody know Chuck? No? Okay. And he works for the, he's worked for the Coast Guard for years and years. And he grew up out on, uh, his grandpa was a fisherman, he grew up out on, on going out onto the lake. So we were out at Outer Island, we were about as far as we could be. And uh, he would, I took a picture of him standing off by himself, and you know, it was a small picture, and, and then when I got together with the publisher, he said, well, he cropped it down and said, you know, do you think this would make a good cover? And I was like, that's perfect. Because it, it, to me, it, it shows a lot, I mean, I like the, uh, the idea that there's hardly any color in it. And you can see the vastness of the ice on the lake. And then it, because of the lack of details on them, it, it looks kind of uh, looks kind of cool. And then you see that little uh, horizontal piece sticking off to the side. That was his ice chisel because he was holding it in both hands, so it's sticking out from the side. And, uh, and of course, any good ice fisherman always has their ice chisel nearby because that's how you check the ice. You know if it's good enough to not only walk on, but to drive a snowmobile on or uh, whatever whatever way you're going to be fishing. So ice chisels are absolutely essential. And they all, you also can use them to bevel your ice hole. So if you have 16 inches of ice and it's you know like this deep and you only have a 10 inch hole, you reach down into the hole with your chisel and you chip out around the edges of it so it ends up like a upside down funnel. So that when the fish's head gets into it, it can slide, it can get vertical up the hole easier. Uh, let's see. Anyway, so, so Chuck, uh, Chuck took a good picture there even though you can't recognize it as him. Okay. 
blood on the ice. You know, it sounds a little sinister almost when you think about it, but what it, what it means is that when you're out on the ice and you're going to some good uh, fishing spots where you think, you know, where you've caught fish before, if you see blood on the ice, that means two things. That means a fish was caught there, probably, or, uh, and the, uh, a gull, the gulls haven't eaten all the blood. Because the gulls will go out and they'll pick up, every, they'll, they'll pack up every little bit of blood so you know, they clean it up perfectly. Oh, so if you get there, a fish was caught fairly recently. So that's, that was the whole idea of the blood on the ice. It wasn't anything, you know, gory. Or, although there were some things that had happened, some tragedies on the ice that were indeed uh, fit that category. Uh, yeah, so I said somebody had to do it, and that was me. And um, I'm at breakfast, and one third of the people I interviewed had passed on since, since I, I, the whole inception of the book. And, so that just showed how many old timers there were at the time. Well, I've become one since I started, you know, so. Uh, but it, it was just so amazing. It, it did take me 11 years to do it because I was still full-time principal at the time. And I, and it took me a long time to get all the stories down. And then to, it, it, was, it was a love-hate relationship by the time I got through with it because, you know, the formatting issues when I had to get it ready for a publisher. So, and I burned out two uh, cassette players just uh, recording all of their and playing them back because I'd have to stop it and reverse it and play it again in order to get their exact language the way they spoke so that when you read it and, and if you know the person you can hear them speaking and, and it's dripping with a lot of the culture of the area too the way they talk so that that was what I was trying to do um, okay. so, uh, let's see now here, this is uh, Jim Hudson. He, he's the person I dedicated the book to. He and I were out together when he, uh, the day he died and uh, went through the ice. And we were, we were together, but I did everything I could to get him out. I even, the ice I was on broke off and went in with him and I, and I took me three tries to get out, but I still couldn't get him out because the ice was you know, just a little thicker than this uh, lectern top there. So you just, it couldn't support much weight. And, yeah, it, it, just, it was just what it was. Um, and you can see uh, I made, uh, and so Jim, and Jim, that was the first time we'd ever done anything together. Uh, you know, we were, we'd been friendly with each other a lot, but we'd never had gone off and done anything. We just wanted to check ice when that happened. Um, these are maps. I made maps that are directly connected with all the stories. So it's, there's local spots that ice fishermen refer to and uh, it explains where a lot of connected with the story. So I use, in the stories, I'll have a reference to a map where you can go and look at the map and see where, where this event happened. Um, and then down in the corner here, I uh, contracted with Greg Alexander to do the beginning of the chapter drawings. So he did, uh, he did we had, had seven chapters, and so he did, did seven uh, drawings for each chapter, and actually later, if you get the chance, if you want to come up, I have, I, know, I put the drawings somewhere, and I have two of them that I brought with, and uh, and his sketches were really good, and very representative, and he's an ice fisherman, so he knew, you know, some good ones, and this, this guy walking away from the sled was an actual event that uh, uh, Hans Martins had when he was with Fred Cassera in one of the stories. Uh, you can see there's the 54 people. There's around 200 st separate stories. Some can be very brief. Some are a lot longer, depending on the storyteller. Um, and there's seven chapters. The, the first chapter is on uh, ice fishing. The second chapter is on close calls and tragedies on the ice. And there's one on history, historical interesting things that have gone on the ice, wildlife, and yeah, humor. So the things that guys used to pull on each other on the ice are just very <laughs> funny. And other events that would take place, whether they were intentional or not, could also be really funny. And we can, I can touch on a couple of those later if you're interested. Um, and, and if you have any questions along the way, you know, feel free to uh, just pipe up and say something. And, and if a phone goes off and you have to take a call, since this is a public setting, I'd appreciate if you come up and I'll give you the microphone and you can take care of your phone call. <laughs> <laughs>
there's around 96 photos, there's over 100 quotes, because some of the guys would make these quotes about ice fishing when I would ask them, what's the best thing about ice fishing? And they would come up with just the coolest expressions and the things you wouldn't expect that were really funny. One of them, Arden Weber, he says, there's no traffic laws. That was really important to him, because he likes to gun it around on his machine and that sort of thing. So, uh, and then the maps, I mean. So, that, that was a nice fish on the bottom. That was a 21 pounder that I caught out by a hermit, and I sent it back down the hole. Uh, yeah, really, this is, this is about them. I mean, I, I don't, I don't even know if I've even paid for my printing from when I first pub, you know, published and paid for all the, uh, the printing for all the books. I, I mean, I still have several boxes of books, so I don't even know if I've paid for it yet. With, so it wasn't about that. It was about preserving their, their stories that these guys had and especially for their uh, their great great grandchildren, or you know, some of their family 50 years from now might read about their you know great 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 grandpa and and be amazed at what he actually did and the kind of ex adventures he had on the ice here. So that 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 to me is the the part. So what I want when a person gets a book is I want them to read it and and to you know be amazed and appreciate the stories and really. Uh, and, and shake their heads and, and think, oh my God, I'd never do that. Or, or you know, that, that sounds exciting. Or, you know, I wish I'd have been there. Or a lot of things. So, uh, and some of the guys here, they were, you know, a lot of them were fit with fish. Uh, and I don't know, does anybody recognize anybody? I'm, that's uh, Kenny Nurse, and that's uh, Vince Hyde. Uh, that's uh, one of the Zachs from Ashland, Chris Hunt from Bayfield, Taylor Foley from Ashland. Ed Erickson from Bayfield. These were two uh, college friends of mine, and they caught this great big brown trout. And then they took it from bar to bar. <laughs> he used to say the trout was as beat up as they were by the time they finished. Like part of the tail was broken off, I guess. And, but it was it was over 20 pounds. It was a really big uh, brown trout. And uh, let's see. There's Hans Martins, uh, uh, Norm Flipsick from uh, the Bagaman, me, uh, Brian Flagg from Washburn, uh, Tim Foley, John Johnson, uh, Greg Radke from Washburn. Uh, so, you know, there, there were guys from all over the area, and I, and I hope that uh, there's some that you recognize. Uh, there was Jimmy Hudson. Uh, he was a really good fisherman. He was a really good guy, and he was, he was really, Really, he was Mr. Safety on the ice, and so that day it was almost like the planets were all aligned that it was his time, and, and obviously that's the way it worked out. But he was a really good guy, and a really heck of a fisherman. Uh, let's see, anything there? Oh yeah, there's the, the chapters, and I probably missed something on that. But there were uh, interesting things, historical stuff, uh, humorous stuff, and then some notable quotes I put at the end. Greg Alexander, he did a great job. He's going to do the cover on my new on my novel that I, I'm just I'll be publishing this year. Um, let's see. Oh, the, the quote down there is a great one too. It said, "He said it looks like we're the only dumb idiots out here." That was one of the quotes that one of the guys said in one of the days. <laughs> or another one said that the, they were marching out, heading toward Houghton Point, and it was snowing really hard and it was northeast and was blowing right into them and he said he says it's just like Shackleton going out into the Antarctic he said, <laughs> and, and there's they had so many good uh, quotes when they would be talking and expressions this is uh, on the uh, south side of Madeline out toward the refuge and we went out one day I was with Jim Hudson and uh, John Nelson and we came upon this because it was exceptional ice so it's like they, they wanted to cross it. And I said, well, how are we gonna get across? Well, this is how they got across. They got out with their chisels, and they start chiseling. And they keep chiseling. They, they look like dandy dancers on a railroad tra uh, tra rail, don't they? Uh, yeah. The way they adjust the rails on a train, on uh, tracks. There we go. They eventually drove across, and then we went another couple of miles till we got to buoy 14, where the line of the refuge is. That was an amazing day, that was really cool. But it almost looks like an alien landscape when you get the, the ice piled up that way. Anybody recognize this spot? 
there's the ice road, and you can tell it's the ice road because it's got dirt on it. There's sand and stuff that uh, ends up getting washed out at the, yeah, it was at the, we're at the Madeline side, yes. Foley, he was in a previous picture, he's in Ashland. And, uh, they, these guys parked all off the uh, landing in Bayfield off the beach, and they all went nose to nose, and there was about a dozen or more of them. And it was on a weekend where there was a sled dog race, and so there's all kinds of people just having a gale time, you know, over by the, uh, by the ferries and sitting in there, and then, and so then these guys come and he comes and he has to tromp out through, slog his way out through the ice, gets in it, and, you know, and we were wondering if that ice was going to still hold it because it was bent pretty good, even though it was thick ice. And uh, he said his, his his boots were still underwater inside the cab, but he managed to back out, got it in four wheel, backed it out. And then we, we, he didn't want to stay around because everybody's pointing and laughing and stuff like that, <laughs> all the, uh, the tourists and the racers. So we, we get over to uh, Viking Motors that Harold Mackey used to have uh, outside, uh, and his son's run it now, outside uh, Bayfield. We pull over and, and he takes his boot off and he tips it and the water pours out and it's steaming. <laughs> and uh, we got a big kick out of that. That was, that was just from uh, last year, and that was a good outing, and of course, you know, you can do the math and to know how many guys that we had with us that day, so that would be the equal, the correct number of fish for the limits. And, uh, yeah, I, I think I kind of compressed them a little bit. They look a little fatter than they probably should be, but that was a very good day. That was out uh, off of Hermit. And that's that's towards uh, Stockton, and Herman is on the left. That's a cool, uh, it's a cool view because there was a lot of blue ice that you could see through there. That was uh, my last outing last year or this year, uh, in March, and uh, I had a little extra bait left over, so I I uh, flung a, a a herring across the ice, and it skidded out toward there and flew down off of a tree on the shore, and and he came kind of. Uh, staggered and going out for it, and then he got it. And you can see it's right, he's almost right on it there. Uh, that was my first fish lab in, in uh, February last year. That was off Cat Island. That was my best outing because then the ice went to heck after that really fast. And the, that's, the, uh, that's the beetle bait. And has anybody here ever fished with a beetle? Ice fished with a beetle at all? It's an it's a old bait, a classic bait, Lyle Lorvik invented it, I interviewed him. And, uh, and it swims, so you can see the, uh, the flippers on the back. The, the two legs, that's cut herring. And then the hook is right here. And then this is the lead part of it that goes to the hook. And so you, you lower it down, you get it real close to the bottom. And then here's, I, I have a beetle on this one right now. And then you, you're, you're literally picking it up just a little bit at a time and it swims in a circle and it's going up and down in a circle and that entices, hopefully, you'll entice the fish to strike it. Then with, with a wire line, you're, this, is, this is wire, you're pulling them up hand over hand and sometimes you get a big fish on it. When they don't want to be pulled up, they go the other way, you gotta let them go. So you, you, the line just you know, kind of slides between your fingers and off they go, if you're lucky enough to have that happen. Uh, that was a 28 inch or so that would have been Around eight pounds, it was a really nice fish. Surf, notice the wording here, surf on turf. Okay, last, this is my last, uh, I was out down by the boat landing, uh, the cold dock, and I come in and I was uh, leaving the cold dock and I, and I start going up the road. I'm still on the uh, gravel there just before it turns the black top. And I look a little ahead of my vehicle and I go up a little further and I say, what the heck? And, and there's a, uh, there's a splake right in, the, right in the middle of the road, and the sun's, you know, and the sun was kind of warm that day, so it's shining down on it, and I, think, I look around, there's nobody. So I, I, I get out, and I pick it up with my hand, I still look around, there's nobody around, and I don't have a bag, and, and so I I just bought a pillow at Walmart the day before, I was still in the back seat. So I grab the pillow, and I grab it with my mouth, and I tear open the bag, and I, and I pull the, I get the pillow out, shake it out, and I put it in there, and so then I start to drive ahead a little bit, and there's, there's another one, except this is a whitefish, and then another one, and then another one, and I ended up with five of them right off the ground there, 
and I didn't, and I, and I looked around, nobody, nobody around, so I, I didn't know who they belonged to. I didn't know if it was somebody from Superior who had been here fishing, or Ashland, or wherever, and that they wouldn't come back, or, you know, so I, I took them. <laughs> and, you know, and then I get home, and then like two weeks later, I find out who they were, Tom Gaber. And that he, they'd fallen off his trailer. And I, on my way out, I must have just missed him. So now I gotta, while I'm here, I, I'll be here long enough to catch some fish. I'll have to go make a trip out to his house and <laughs> kind of replenish uh, <laughs> what he lost. But, uh, oh, those whitefish were dull. They were so good. <laughs> but, yeah, sorry, Tom, and thanks, Tom. <laughs> Uh, this, this is a classic picture, and probably some of you have seen it if you've seen any historical stuff, but this was the Nelsons, both Julian and uh, Bobby Nelson gave me permission to, to use this in the book. And this is when they had gotten back from the, they were in the Navy, I believe, and uh, this, I believe, let's see, this I think is Ed Erickson, that's cab driver, and that's Julian Nelson. And they were, no, cab driver's back there. I don't know who the middle guy was, but uh, they were, they come back from the service and they were wanting some, to get some fish. So they went down, they got a ride down and put in some nets and then the next day when they went to pick them up, they didn't have a ride. So they got the cab, they hired the cab to take them down so they could pull their nets. <laughs> and that's what they were doing there. And, and, that's, and that was, I mean, that had to be in the, uh, mm, I think it was in the mid or early to mid 40s, maybe even earlier, I'm not, I'm not positive. Uh, there's the cornucopia gang. Now, notice that the guys are pulling a boat, and that's the way they fished. And they would walk like two miles in one direction, uh, out, pulling the boat behind them. And they, there was always the same number in the team because they couldn't take on any guests or anybody who wanted. There was always guys who wanted to go with them, but they couldn't because that's all the boat would hold. So that if if their ice broke off, which it, which it often could do up in cornucopia. And, uh, up on the North Shore just because it's uh, so open there. There's no islands to lock the ice in. Uh, they, they break off and uh, then they pile all their gear and pile into the boat and roll back to the good ice, to, to the mainland ice and get out. And, and that happened many times, I mean, all the time. And some guys would leave stuff, they'd leave all their stuff on the ice and just watch it go off in the distance. One guy's, they, uh, their ice broke off and they didn't have time to get everything off. So they left a, um, they had a, a radio on and they, they could hear the radio playing as it went out, uh, as the ice went out. And they could hear it from a, quite a distance, you know, when it was out there. Uh, other guys, they, they came in, uh, in, a, in a boat and it was, it, was blowing, it was blowing pretty good. So they had a strong headwind that they were rolling into and it was really cold. So ice was building up on the outside of the hull of the boat. And by the time they got up to shore, he said, they could have stuck their thumb over the side and it would have touched the water. I mean, that, and, and what do you do if you go in like that? Oh my gosh, I can't imagine. But you know, that's just a, just a small uh, bit of the many stories that there were. Uh, Craig Hoopman, he was, uh, he was in a gale out, out at north, uh, a northwestern gale out by outer, in between outer and cat. And uh, he said that, that they were, it was all ice by them because it had blown at them. And they were in the middle of it. It would be raising really high and lowering. There was these huge swells. And they were in a flat bottom open boat. And uh, I mean, that sounded like incredibly, I, I would have been just scared to death. I can't imagine. Uh, there's the kind of tents that we use. These are these were called the, the Winslow's, uh, were the ones that we used to use a lot. And, of course, you can see how guys will tether their tent to their snowmobile or their uh, their ice augers or something to hold it down so if it gets real windy, it doesn't take off. I was off Holden Point once and it was blowing so hard that I had to get my snowmobile skis, on uh, one ski on the side, and then I chiseled holes in the ice for my uh, stays on my tent to go into and then filled them with water so it would freeze to the, to the ice. And my tent was shaking so hard it was like being in a you know propeller plane when you get in those and they vibrate a lot when it's uh, getting ready to take off that's what it, that's what it was like and really loud really loud uh, there's a few great quotes here uh, 
uh, Smooth Samuelson. He was he was the one that uh, I went to his house. I brought a 12 pack of beer with me, and we sit and did the whole recording. And I pressed the button, and he told all his stories. And I went back and I started to, you know, to replay it so I could type it out. I'd never press record. So I had to get on the phone, call him up, and I had to promise him I'd bring him more beer back, and, and he agreed to it. And so we did it again, and it, it worked. Uh, and I don't know. Uh, and Could you read those? Sure. Uh, top one. Uh, this is Moose. He's saying, "I mean, they were biting like bulldogs. God, they were really hitting." And when you hear that kind of talk, if you're an ice fisherman, that just you know that, that just really gets it, gets you going. They were pulling that truck up. This is Chris Hunt, and I'll never forget. His whole inside of his truck was solid full of custard-filled donuts. <laughs> I was up in Bayfield when they, 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 he saw a bunch of stuff on the ice when he, Chris was driving a new truck that their company got, a Hunt Electric, and, and he wanted to go see what, well, it was, but it was from a truck that sunk earlier in the day, and there was stuff on the ice, and he started going for it, and then his broke through, and it started to sink, and he climbed out, and he, was, and he was standing in the box and he was trying to think of ways to lighten it so it wouldn't sink so fast. So he's throwing the tools overboard and stuff. And then finally it gets down and he's standing on top of the cab. And when his feet started getting wet, then he finally just dove in. Oh my. And then he got, he got to some ice and he climbed out and he fell through and he'd take a couple steps and he'd fall through. He said he fell through about six, seven times. And the guys were on the shore exhorting him, come on, come on, you can do it, you know. And, and he'd fall through it and climb out. And, and then he said, he, he said after he'd fallen through enough times, then he crawled on his belly and kind of slithered along, he said, and, until he could get to better eyes. Uh, and then uh, John Lumberg says, I mean, you don't go anywhere without checking the ice, do you? You check it. <laughs> and and that's, that's good, wise advice. And that's, this is what you check it with, your, your chisel. And, and, and a lot of guys will go by how many pokes it takes before he goes through. You know, some guys will go with three pokes, you're good. And that's, that's a general rule of thumb. And uh, for me, it, you know, it's, it's the thickness of, and the hardness of the ice. Different, ice is very different. Some ice is extremely hard, other ice is, you know, uh, mushy, other ice is in between. And so you have to really check it and then know what kind of ice you have before you go driving your snowmobile on it, for example. Uh, Next one is Leo, Leo Reader, and he says, we shoulda had a poke, shoulda, woulda, coulda, don't count. <laughs> and then of course, South Channel. And, and a lot of you know where the South Channel is. South Channel, I always tell people, the ice never wants to be there. It's there, but it wants, never wants to stay there. And that's, that's one of the most dangerous places. And several guys have uh, gone through out there and never made it out. And then, then just to echo that, uh, how many know uh, Simon Schultz? Who you, yeah, he was a long time Washburn resident. He says, that channel, that, the South Channel, that's the worst one. That's a wicked area. I love the expression wicked, you know, I mean, you don't use that as much these days. It was, it was an apt expression. Uh, oh, it's more. And this is uh, Rule Fleming up in Cornucopia. He says, wham, it's that jerky guy. It's one jerk. It's a jerk on both ends of the line. <laughs> and then Bob Truchon Sr. says, cause we live in a cluttered world anyways. And if you can get your mind off of that other stuff for a while and put it on this, it's just good therapy, I think. And then Julian Nelson, of course, he lived to be 100. Uh, he said, the memorable times were most, mostly miserable. <laughs> And he laughed, and then uh, uh, Glenn Miller, uh, raunchy, uh, who's a college uh, classmate of mine, says, the more dogs you had on the ice, the warmer your feet would be. Because <laughs> the dogs would always come up and curl around the guys if it was really cold, and then their feet would be warm. This is, anybody know Raleigh Erickson? He was a longtime Washburn resident, too. He's in Shell Lake now. I just talked to him uh, a week ago. When he was seven, eight years old, back in the 40s, his mom, Tina, wrote a song, uh, and it was, it was, and he, I was visiting him in Shell Lake, and he sang it for me, because he was a ch in his church choir, so he could sing good, and he sang this song that his mom would sing to him when he was a kid, and it was about Knut, Mose, and Dolph working at the munition, at the Pond Munitions plant, and uh, Gary, what were the, the names of these guys? Knut Larson, Mose, Wednesday, and Dolph. 
Okay. They were, they were the actual, they weren't just made for the song, they were, they were the actual characters. And the, the sign, I don't know the melody, but Knut Mosendolf, Mosendolf got laid off at the plant. They wanted to work, but they told him they can't. They really weren't sorry, because they did wish, to go out to Herbster and catch them some fish. And Knut Mosendolf stayed out at Knut's shack. In the morning they went bobby, bobby, and at night they came back. After some supper, they talked and played cards. And the fish that, that they caught were now measured by yards. <laughs> What's that smell, boys? What's that smell, boys? Seems it's getting stronger. If I don't get a liar's license, I can't stay here any longer. I want you to know so you don't feel so blue. I'm nuts about Bobby, so I must be crazy, too. <laughs> and he can remember his mom singing that to him when he was just a little, a little kid. So that's cool. And, and this goes to show you that you know, know how much how much open space there is. If you get on a snowmobile lane, bad things can happen. And he really, really wasn't run over. He was just. <laughs> There's an old picture of some guys. You can see their fish uh, laying down in front of them. These these guys were off Ashland, but uh, those. It looks like it's cold day because the fish to me look frozen. I, I mean, I, I've seen so many pictures of fish. They looked like they were pretty frozen hard, so that was that was a cold day. This was an especially especially cold day. How, any of you ever heard of uh, uh, Crohn's landing on the other side of Madeline Island? Yeah, that's that's a great. If you can go off there onto the ice, that means it's good ice, and there's a real chance for some real big fish there. So we went there one morning. It was 13 below when we got to the the lot, and there was these guys from Ashland ahead of us, and it's just memorable. I just I'll never forget it. And the one guy, he was out there, he was wearing gym shoes, he had sweatpants, and he had a sweatshirt. No hat, no, and, he, and no gloves. And he, he was loading up the boat with their gear, and they were getting ready to push off to, to go drag the boat out onto the ice. And it just, I, you know, and I get cold hands. I don't, if I don't have hand warmers, I'm doomed. And this guy had, it, it was amazing. I, I just couldn't believe it. It was very impressive. <laughs> that, that, this was a standard uh, gear for a lot of guys in, in, uh, that I know, and that was the three-wheeler pulling the boat, and uh, you know, and that, that's it. That's what they'd go out on, and that was their, their insurance, and, and it, was, it wasn't always easy to get to if you did have a problem. It's kind of an interesting juxtaposition there with the old ore dock and then the, uh, the tent in the foreground. Now this little guy, who's about 6'3 now, 230 pounds, great big kid now, but at the time, he was, uh, he, his dad had brought him and his sister out and we were camped in a, we had like a group of circle out by the uh, uh, Hermit Island and he was getting a little rammy and but his dad let him drive his snowmobile around the camp so he's zooming in out between tents and he's, he's getting more and more excited. Pretty soon he loses control and crashes into another guy's sled and, Calling on his dad's machine, and, and it, it was, we knew it was coming, we knew it was going to happen, but his, his dad just didn't quite foresee that. I don't know why not, he didn't. But you could just tell by the expression on his face that he was psyched up for the day. Okay, now, this is, you know, I, I did bring a couple things with me. I, you know, you could see the, the bobbing stick, and, and they used to carve their own, they, some guys still do, out of wood and they'll have finger holes, they'll be like notches for fingers, and, uh, and this is what the wire goes around. Um, show you a little. This, is, this is the beetle, which is the uh, preferred bait for a lot of guys. And, and it, it looks small, but when you put uh, a piece of herring that long on it, then, then it really swims really nice, and the, the flippers just move up and down, just like, you know, like, and, and are very, very enticing. I mean, I could say I'd probably bite it. And I'd probably be telling the truth. <laughs> just because it's the way we think. But, uh, and I've had stories of guys, there's stories in the book where guys have been bobbing, and, and you're like, you know, you're, you're down, let's say, 200 feet, and you, you often fish over 100 feet, and we fish as deep as 250 feet. 
and you're moving your line up and down, moving it up and down, and then you'll get, it'll just stop dead or be pulled back the other way when they hit really hard. And guys have had their, their uh, sticks slapped against the ice and their line just snapped by, by, by big trot. I mean, and, and, and the biggest one to come out uh, that I know of was the, um, from Ashland, um, was the Frenchman, uh, oh God. Anyway, he, he caught it out by Stockton and he caught it on a rod and it got near the surface and, um, and, and Roger Gima was with him and he was, they were gonna, and, and Todd Dreyer, and they were gonna try to, they were gonna play the fish for him Well, he got it up and, and it came up to the hole and, and he started yelling, he goes, it's a shark, it's a shark. And, and then uh, Roger said, uh, Roger Gima said, he says, my teeth almost fell right down the hole. <laughs> and then they got a hold of it by the gills and, and they had to be on each side of the fish and he says, and we birthed it through the hole. I birthed it. <laughs> yeah, and then they just laid it on the ice and just stared at it. Because it was, it was over 40 pounds. Wow. That was a big fish. OK. Uh, now, you know, at, and, and at this point, I, again, going back to it, and, and hopefully you can tell by some of the stories that it, it's, they're just so interesting, so amazing. And guys, have just have had such great experiences out there, and such adventures. I mean, Simon Schultz was on a big ridge uh, where, where ice meets and then pushes up a pressure ridge. And so he's standing on, and he's checking it with his, his chisel, you know, and he's hitting it, hitting it. And then he gives it one last pull, and the whole thing caves in, falls down about eight feet, and the ice stops right at his toes. And he's standing there with his chisel in his hand, and he's looking down this hole into this slush and pieces of ice. And he's, he just backed up there. And he went through over by Houghton Point one time, and he said, when he, by the time he got out, he said, my legs were just like rubber. And he says, I could hardly, hardly walk. So uh, I guess this would be a time to, uh, if you have any kind of questions, or even if you wanted to share something about, you, you know, briefly about where you've gone, or you know, if you've been on the ice before. Yes? Explain to me how a tip-up works. Tip-ups, yeah, tip-ups, you, you can't fish them deeper than 50 feet, so I've never fished them. <laughs> but you, you, you have a, a, a line that has a, a real uh, a spool, and it, it, it turns freely, and so... It's down in the water? So you put it in the water, but it's got a, uh, like a plate that sits on the ice larger than the hole. So it, it, it starts like this, and then you tip it down into the water, you let out the amount of line until you get, you check where the bottom is, or usually you're fishing at less than 50, so you go close to the bottom if you're fishing, some fish, if you're fishing like northerns, you can go a lot higher, and then uh, you'll, you'll bait it, and then uh, you'll spool, make sure it's on your spool, and then it's got a little clip that holds it, and then they'll, the, the fish will pop it off, and then your flag goes up. The flag is what holds it, the pressure of the flag. Okay. If the flag goes up, then you know that it's popped off there. They'll either run or they'll, well, you know, depending on the fish, what they'll do. Thank you. Yes? You talked about the men. What about the two women? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Tina Nelson, she's, and she was a good bobber. She would, she liked to, she had the, the perk minnow was her favorite bait. I remember that. But she, she caught an 18 pounder off of, uh, over by the island near shore, and she was only in, she was only like in, in 20 feet or 25 feet of water. So it was, that's shallow to catch a big fish like that. And she would by herself, so she fought it and fought it and fought it and fought it, and she finally got out, landed it herself, then called her husband over it, and he was working at the time at the, uh, uh, one, of the one of the restaurant bars, and and she, she said to the, what she just caught, he says, no. She goes, yeah, and she he goes, she goes uh, should I bring her with me? He says, of course, you know. And, she, and then when, by the time she got there, she was an instant celebrity. <laughs> and you know, everybody had to come and see the fish and, and had, uh, had to hear her story. Uh, and then another, another person that uh, I interviewed, um, she and I were going out at the time, and she had uh, just learned how to ice fish. And we were out at Houghton Point, and we were, we were fishing for cohos and browns, and we were doing really well. And uh, she just 
she just couldn't believe how much fun it was. And then, then we went out uh, one day out by uh, Prescott Point, uh, uh, Stockton, and she caught like an 11 pounder by herself. I'd gone away to check on other guys. I came back and she had to cover it with snow, and then she uncovered it to show me. You know, and, and that was, I, yeah. Women and there's other women bobbers that I I didn't know at the time that I that I could have interviewed but just didn't. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes. That forty pound fish that you re referred to, what kind of fish was it? Lake trout. Yes, and and I think they were in deep water. They were in like 215 feet. Uh, they were pretty deep, and and it took a while to get that up, with, especially with fishing rod, you know, because you can't. You just can't pull that weight up your, you know, your your rod can't do it. It just can't do it. So you have to. Uh, it takes you have to kind of work with the fish to do it. Uh, that that was that was amazing fish. And it's mounted and it's in. Uh, where is it? I think I think there's a. It's got a clipped pin too. So it, it's it's either in uh, angler anglers all. I think it's in anglers all. Yes. Um, the, the, the what I, I don't I don't know a lot of stories about Saxon Harbor. I know the one though where the guys were on the south side of Madeline, the whole crew, and, and this was back in the uh, this was like in the 30s or early 40s, and a giant chunk broke off that was probably three quarters of a mile in size and drifted over to Saxon Harbor, and 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 the guys were on it overnight until they got to Saxon Harbor, and then when it it shored on Saxon Harbor. They just drove off onto the shore, and there's all these reporters there, and they're trying to get these guys' names and stuff. And they wouldn't give them their right names because they were afraid that their wives would find out that they were on the ice. <laughs> and they, they'd rather tell them they were in the bar than tell them that they were out on the ice. So that was that was the one story I know. Do you use a gaff? Pull them out. That's, that's another great question. I sometimes do. I don't like to in case I decide to release them, but I, I like to use the boga grip where you, you pull the part of the handle back and it opens, and opens these two non-sharp jaws and then you close it on their lip and then you can just slide them out of the hole without uh, you know, having to stick a hook in them. Uh, that big fish that I showed in the beginning, that 21 pounder, uh, Tim Foley was with me, and of course he took the gaff out, and he stuck the gaff in it, and pulled it the rest of the way out of the hole, and I thought, oh man, this fish is going to die. And, and, and then it, there wasn't hardly any blood on the ice, and what had happened is he, he had gone under the skin with the hook, and it just stayed under the skin, it never got into meat. So he, it just got pulled out by the skin, so that was pure luck, I was really glad that that turned out like it did. Anything else? You know, and I, and I keep thinking about so many of the guys that have passed on, and I, I sat down with every one of them and listened to their stories, and you know, we joked or we had a beer or two, or, and 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 they were great storytellers. You know, and especially if you're passionate about your, what you're talking about, you know, then then you can anybody can tell a good story. Then, uh, yes, I'm not a fisherman at all. Tell me how you decide you're going to throw it back. Or you're going to take it home with you. Okay, when I caught it. How does that happen? Uh, when the fish is the larger the fish, the more fat content it has in their uh, in their flesh, in their muscle and stuff. So usually, and there those are usually good breed stock because they'll produce larger fish. So those are the, the biggest ones you want to let go. You can take measurements, take pictures, and get a beautiful reproduction made, and hopefully not kill the fish. Depending on how you know when you take them up, if their gills are bleeding, they're done. They they won't make it. So, you know, you, you, when you catch them, you can't, you can't beat them up, bringing them up, and, and, you, and when you take them out, you have to handle them as carefully as you can if you want to release them. And otherwise, and, and you can get fish that are a good specimen. You know, they might be, it might be a longer, larger fish, but if it's lean looking and, it, and it's, you know, and it's real strong and really, uh, uh, you know, just flipping and shaking and just never gives up, that's, that's usually a sign of a really good specimen that probably has really good meat, would be delicious. But others are would be shorter and stockier, then then there's gonna likely they're gonna have a lot of fat in them that you don't want to eat. Now, and one thing I don't know is I don't know the time, so I don't want to be you know, out of control here. Ooh, and we're probably almost pretty good. 
Can you talk for a minute about the ice houses? It seems like for many people there, the guys equivalent of the deer hunting shack. Yes, uh, the, the ice houses in, are main, mainly in the bay. You could, you can't put them out in the islands because it's it, the ice is all, uh, too iffy. And and then the ones that are in the bay, you have to have them off by March 15th, I believe. And those can be. You know, you haul them out with vehicles because they're heavy and they have some really nice ones, uh, but they can also freeze into the ice and, and getting them out can be a challenge sometimes. Uh, Tom Hicks, who's a, a fishing guy and he's a really good one now, he, he had the story, he was in 10 feet of water over near uh, uh, Brush Point, over near the sloughs, and he was, he was by, he had a, one of the guy in the tent with him, it was a, a guy's son, and he gets this fish on it. He's fighting this fish and fighting this fish, and, and he sees it down in the hole, and it's just huge. And he finally uh, gets it up and gets it inside. And it was the day before the contest, so they were just kind of, you know, you can't keep it or anything. But uh, for the contest, they would have won with ease. But it was a lake trout, and it was 23 pounds and 10 feet of water in the bay, which is I've never heard of it. And and so then he he took the fish. And he went over to uh, one of the nearby uh, uh, campers that was out there, Big Shack. They had a bunch of guys, like eight guys in it. And he said he, he stuck his head inside and, and he said he, tanked, he, he took his hat off and he threw it down. He says, that's it. And they're all looking at him and they're like, what? And then he, he had it behind his back and he took the fish out and flopped it down in front of them. And they were, they just, they were awestruck. They couldn't believe that it came out where it did. And, of course, he couldn't use it for the tournament. But. Yes? Yeah, speaking of ice houses, I had a friend out in South Dakota, had a brilliant idea for his ice house. He put a plexiglass bubble over the top, so he had it light and warm. But what happened when he was gone, so much warmth that it melted the ice around the thing. Oh. It sunk halfway through and refroze. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can't imagine. Yes? I know with other kinds of fishing, you can catch fish that you really, really don't want. Does that ever happen with the kind of ice fishing you're talking about? The dreaded Siskiwit trout, <laughs> the fats. Those, those, it's a, it's a different lake trout, and it's, it's heavily, got a lot of body fat, and, and they're oily, and uh, you can smoke smaller ones, and they're, they're okay, but you can't eat the other ones. I mean, I, I said it to Gary earlier. It, if the seagulls won't eat them, <laughs> and they don't, they'll pick a hole in it, and then it's like they get inside. It's like, oh no, not for me. And they back off. They they just won't do it. And so Cisco trout are the worst. And then there's, you know, the, some guys look down upon catching the eel pouts, eel pout, lawyer, um, burbot. Um, you know, they those are because they they're kind of, they're they're bottom feeders, but. They they uh, they're not they, they don't have the same body structure. They're real flat. They're like a catfish look to them, and and you, you catch them and you take them out and they wrap their tail around your wrist or something. And, and you know, guys don't like that, so uh, nobody would. But they uh, but they they can be really good eating if you if you cook them it right and prepare them. Yes, exactly. Poor man's lobster. They're known as because they and you, if you put their meat in a pan. It'll cook in like a minute. They, they cook really fast, and they have extra large livers. And Raleigh Erickson told me they used to cook the livers up. They, they dust them off in uh, flour, and then cook them in oil, and they're very good. Yes? Um, I have heard, I, this is just what I've heard. I have no, no facts to back me up on this. But <laughs> supposedly, the lampreys are declining in numbers yeah, I've I've seen a live lamprey. I've maybe seen two in all the years I've been on. Really? Yeah. So and, and you'll see some lamprey stars, but not many. You know, and, and and you're right. I saw a lot more earlier on, and I've seen less of them uh, now. And, and one other thing I did not go into was the close calls or the tragedies out there. I didn't go into the uh, the, uh, um, the wind sled accident that happened with. Uh, um, Butterfield and, um, the, and, and I can't think of his name. Uh, and, and, and they, they that was over between um, 
Front Bay in uh, Oak Island. And what happened was they had, they, most of them were all pushers. So in other words, the, uh, the propellers on the back of the boat facing out behind the boat and they pushed the boat. This one's a boat. So the propeller was on the inside, right behind the guys. And he, there was no, there was no cover over it. They didn't have a, a cover over it. And the shaft broke and it came forward and hit both guys. Oh, and, and the one Earl Russell, it cut his gluteus maximus off down to the back of his knees. So it took the meat off the back of him, his butt and the, uh, down to his knees. And the other guy cut him at the waist and left about this much of him at the waist. And, um, and Earl Russell, he, he, he was a legend. He was just incredibly strong and tough. He took, because they were commercial fishing at the time, so they had like lines and, and stuff. So he, he took some of the buoy lines and stuff, wrapped them around, pulled his meat up to himself, wrapped it around him, and went walking out, started a fire to attract attention, went walking off for help. When they came back and finally found him, he was over a mile from the uh, from the accident, walking like that with with so much of his, his meat cut off, and and uh, and the, the guy who was who was there, uh, Earl Russell, Jack Erickson was uh, at the Bayfield Landing, or uh, they were doing they were doing a dress uh, things for Navy at the time, or the Coast Guard at the time. They were all in their dress uniforms, and. Uh, Arden Weber's dad, uh, Bud Weber, came flying in and said that they, there was a bad accident out there, and that uh, and he had Earl Russell in the in his plane. He picked him up, found him, saw his tracks, and followed the blood line, you know, blood uh, trail, and and picked him up and, and brought him back there. And then, and then he said that Earl, Earl um, Steve Butterfield was out there. and He was in really bad shape and, and he needed help. And so Jack Erickson got in the plane and flew out there, and they loaded him on a sled. And of course, they had to kind of push his insides in, in to, him to load him on the sled. And then he said he was in his, his shoes were spit shined and he's running across the ice and, and in the snow running for uh, Frog Bay. And, and then the, uh, the hearse, which doubled as the ambulance, met them there and they loaded him into the back of the ambulance and started to go toward uh, Ashland and uh, to take him to the hospital, and, and he thawed out along the way and then bled out and, and died. But, uh, it, it, you know, there, there, was, there was lots of different things like that, but that was, that was something. And, and Earl, uh, Earl Russell still ended up going out and commercial fishing after that, uh, once he healed up in the hospital. And, 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 and I, I didn't know that but until I'd heard it, but they said that they would pour maggots into his wounds. To, to clean them, and, and because they would eat only the dead tissue, and it really it accelerated his healing, and it really helped uh, helped him get recovered. But that guy was so strong. I heard that he once he would carry a box of fish up steps, and the box would weigh 300 pounds, and he would carry that up steps uh, and and unload barrels off of the side of the boats onto the docks and stuff. Jeez. Anything else? <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, I hope that this was not only entertaining, but would in, encourage you to maybe, you know, to, to think about either going to the library and checking it out, or I, I have some of the books with me. I have some extras with me, and they're they're twenty four ninety five retail, and I'm just selling them for twenty flat if if you want one. And anybody who's in, if you know anybody who's an outdoorsman, it's great, and because it's the stories aren't all connected, you can pick it up and put it down, and, and it's a good, you know, either a bedside reader or whatever that, that you. You can take it a little at a time and it still works. Great. Thank you so much for coming. It was really enjoyable for me and I hope it was okay for you too.